Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to the presentation and thanks for coming to the session. It's really nice to have a geophysics session always and at the CAAs. Um, Katie and I are both going to be talking about uh, the project, this project, uh, Bucera, that we worked on in Jordan, but we're also going to be going a little bit further afield um, because we've had a lot of different experiences in a lot of different places, and this is just one example. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that this is um, a collaboration between both the University of California, Berkeley, and the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies in uh, Arkansas, at the University of Arkansas. And Katie and I both work at the University of Arkansas, so we have um, been doing the geophysics portion of this. And I want to say that we have been trained in the North American kind of way of doing things. <laughs> and some people might argue that, you know, is there really a North American way of doing things? But we do have a very uh, unique um, uh, problem or problems in the United States. One being that it's huge. There are so many different site types out there. Um, there's uh, different types of ground cover. There's different, type, different site types. Um, and <clears throat> We also have a lot of things that are very subtle features. We don't have Roman walls. So when we're out there doing geophysics with the magnetometer, we're walking quite slow. We're making sure we have very good ground control on everything in order to be able to find these really subtle features. Um, we are limited to most of the time. We cannot do motorized types of uh, prospection because of various reasons. We, have limited areas that we're working in, and we also have different um, types of land status where we might be restricted with private land, um, different agencies, and uh, permitting issues to do that type of thing. Um, I don't know, Katie, do you want to go into any of the other portions on this out, this portion? Um, no. So this is just the outline of what we'll be going over. So I'll um, be going over some additional um, adversities that we face in the field and give you a little bit of background of how um, we came to the Bucera project and the nature of the other projects that we've been working on. So, and that requires a little bit more explanation of the nature of the work that we do. Um, this particular project, as Christine mentioned, is um, part of the spatial archaeometry research collaborations at CAST. And what we do is um, provide work field award, provide all sorts of awards, including field awards for geophysics, in which we um, take applications from people that want to incorporate geophysics into their research um, because it's new to their particular area of research or particularly to a region that they work in. So that puts us in the position of being in some pretty, um, pretty difficult survey situations, not only because they're all over the world and we're facing constantly new conditions, but because we're working in areas where geophysics haven't been done routinely before. And in a lot of these cases, there are a lot of reasons that that has been the history of those areas, particularly because of these adverse conditions that we'll be talking about. Um, so due to the nature of these pilot projects, the, the, the difficult conditions that we all encounter as geophysicists, uh, service, surface conditions, soil conditions, geology, all of the things that are mentioned in the abstract of this session are, are compounded by these pilot projects themselves. We're limited in scale and time. We're generally in the field for two weeks to do a massive project uh, to prove or disprove whether these methods are going to work on these sites or not. Um, we're constantly in different places. We're not familiar with, we don't have the luxury of being familiar with the local geology and the soil types, and we're constantly having to um, rely on others for this critical information, um, which presents a really unique situation in which uh, I'll discuss a little bit further, but let's see. We start this process out by taking applications. We require a certain amount of information, um, what the objectives are, um, and all of, these, all of these types of information that, um, say, the previous project has, you're a group of team members, you work together, you know your site, you've worked there for quite a while, you have a relationship with one another, you know what your knowledge level is in this application. Every time we show up on a project, we have no idea what their background is. 
and they tell us what they know, they tell us what they need, and we just have to work with that. Um, and Christine will talk a little bit about how that's affected the results of the survey at Bucera, and I'll go over some of the other um, projects that we've done that with. So, um, in the application process, we do as much as we can to get as much information as we can to anticipate whether it's going to be a successful project or not. And uh, you know, we make instrument selections based on that. We predict what the survey size is going to be. And, and keep in mind, these are all places we've never been before. You generally, countries we've never been to before. Um, we've done the first geophysical survey in southern Africa, the first in southern India. Um, places where we don't know what we're going to encounter on the ground on the site, but also just culturally, um, there are a lot of other adverse <laughs> elements at play here as well, which we'll talk about. So we get to the field and, and we're really excited uh, to do the first geophysical project in southern India or south, southern Africa, or uh, as Christine will talk about, some of the, the first that we did in, in um, Jordan. And of course, a lot of the things that we've encountered are things that you've all encountered. Um, people, we always ask, you know, is there ground cover? No, no, there's not many trees here. There aren't many rocks here. So we end up encountering these situations where we have to have, um, you know, I, I would say that at least half of the projects we've shown up on, we haven't, if we had seen the site before, we would have said, no, we're not doing geophysics here. The, the conditions are too restrictive. We're not going to get, there's not a good chance we're going to get good results. And in some cases, we have gotten really poor results. And in some cases, we've had surprisingly good results. And I want to talk a little bit about the nature of that. Um, so in one particular example, at Largo Gap in New Mexico, we had extremely difficult site conditions. And this is a case where we were working with someone who was trained in GPR and should have been able to tell us that the surface conditions were nearly impossible for GPR. Um, that the picture on the bottom here, it's a little bit deceiving because it's at the base of this um, this great house mound. Um, but on the on the mound itself, where we were doing the rest, the the primary part of the survey, it was completely covered in boulders that were this big. There was no way we we're going to pull the GPR antenna over it and get good results. And as Christine mentioned, working in North America, we are faced with a lot of restrictions as far as, you know, we, we don't want to move all the rocks. Even if we could move all the rocks, we shouldn't because uh, a lot of the archaeological evidence that's interpretable without excavation is based on the distribution of these stones and um, rubble across the area. So we can't move the rocks. We, we end up pulling the GPR over the rocks. We get really poor results. But fortunately, you know, we have the luxury of throwing in extra sensors from time to time, and in this case, we, we always take a kite with us if we can't take a drone, throw in the thermal camera. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Unfortunately, in this case, even though the GPR results were really poor, we had um, some really good results from our aerial thermography, which were kind of an experimental approach that, that wasn't requested by the award, awardee on the, in this case, but um, because we could, we threw it in. So another... Uh, Another area that we were working in that was quite challenging, and, it, and definitely one of the sites that we showed up on and said, I can't believe we put ourselves in this situation. This is absolutely impossible. Um, we, another luxury that we don't have in North America a lot, unless we're working in the, the Great Plains with vast open areas, is um, that we have to have restricted survey areas sometimes. That said, some of these, the areas that we we're able to survey in this incredibly treed, vegetated environment that, and under the vegetation are massive rodent holes as well. So not only were we constantly tripping over the vegetation, but falling into holes and trying to hold the magnetometer, um, you know, level, uh, and and well, and adapting the magnetometer for the first time in our lives to be a single. It's a Bartington 601-2. It's supposed to have two sensors, but. Oh shoot, we, we don't have any cell phone reception. We, we never configured it for one sensor before we got to figure this out. So those are some of the challenges we're facing and some of the solutions. Um, and oh, and then I'm sorry, but I was getting to the point about uh, really small survey areas. So our actual survey grids were quite small, less than, less than uh, I think generally they were, the biggest one was 15 by 20 and the smallest one was just a few meters by 10 meters. And generally we don't have that the luxury of contextual geophysical information to, um, to provide contrast for our interpretations. And so we just thought there's no way we're going to get good results in this case. Um, but fortunately, with persistence uh, and in a lot of not, I, don't, I can't believe we didn't kill 
not, e not only each other, but the rest of the people on the project. Um, we ended up getting some really good results. And I, I for forgot to mention that another um, challenging aspect is that we have collaborating geophysicists. Um, in this case, someone else was on the site doing GPR, um, which we thought would be great. We're going to be able to compare our magnetometry data with their GPR data, but come to find out they, they don't have the training that we do. We, we assume that everybody uses survey tapes and georeferences their, their geophysical data, but that's absolutely not the case. And um, we assume that that's what all geophysicists did. And that led us to some initial uh, misinterpretations of the data because it, their GPR data was misaligned with ours until we finally had to say, um, could it, is it possible that you don't have this registered properly? Did you have control? And it, no, no, we didn't. So it's become this, this very, um, difficult process of politely questioning everyone's methods and politely questioning everybody's knowledge and background in what we're doing. Um, and this leads us to another situation um, beyond survey results themselves, but interpretations, handing the data off to our collaborators um, with our interpretations, and then having them send us manuscripts uh, with their additional interpretations without any geophysical background at all. And that, it, I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's a very tenuous situation where we say, no, actually, that's not the case. I'm sorry that that's the thrust of your dissertation, but it's wrong. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we've been facing. But Christine will talk a little bit more specifically about the Bucera project. And um, with, with that background, given of the nature of what we're doing and some of the limitations that we have because of that. Okay, so uh, the BCHP is the uh, Bucera Cultural Heritage Project, and uh, this is uh, one of the projects that we got through, from Spark um, through the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, and these are the just things that they wanted to kind of establish or try and figure out, and uh, one of them is to use geophysics to ident identify some of the settle select domestic settlements uh, to sample. And so this happened in 2014, 2015. Um, so the location of this is in Southwest Jordan. Um, and it's an Iron Age site. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. What we were working with um, was Terrace 1. Terrace 2 is all private land. And the areas in blue you can see are, are actually already excavated, so there is some exposed architecture out there. Uh, this is kind of how it looks uh, as a DEM draped over the imagery, imagery draped over the DEM. Um, so it's, it's quite terraced. Um, on either side of the main terrace, So this is the main area that we're going to be working in. Uh, this is a palace complex that's already been excavated. And it's over here. It's in a lot of private land. Where they were thinking um, the residential stuff would be is right along here. So they really wanted to focus on it. And so we got to the site, and it, the area was a lot larger than we were kind of thinking. So we had to think logistically about you know, how many transactors <coughs> Um, one of the things that we had to question um, politely <laughs> is uh, what um, geophysical instruments should we use? They really were adamant that we wanted to use GPR because it works. It's worked in Petra, it's worked all over the place in Jordan and in the area. But uh, we drew in the magnetometer thinking maybe that would actually be good. Maybe the GPR wouldn't give us results, so let's try out the magnetometer. That was after they specifically said, don't bring the magnetometer. It turns out that maybe someone working on the site does magnetometry and there's very high and make, uh, as a consultant. He said, absolutely, it would never work. Like, well, maybe, I don't, I, don't, I don't know of any other sites it's been used at, but let's throw it in, we can. So we did. Um, the, another part of it was uh, the ground conditions, asking them, okay, is it clear? It looks clear in all of the images, sure, it's a wide open space, right? But trying to pull the GPR along this area, um, the rocks were 
there were a lot of rocks, but they weren't even just consistent size, so it wouldn't kind of drag over very nicely. They were all over the place. And I'm not even sure if we had a cart, if it would have worked or if we would have been plowing the GPR, all the rocks up in front of the GPR. So we solved it by buying some rakes and we actually combed the desert. Just, this is one of the few sites we, we were actually allowed to do this. In. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we were questioning that too. Are we really allowed to do this? Um, we felt really guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so after, this is after we actually got back, we get this nice imagery actually of uh, the alignments up in the palace. And you know, you're on the ground and you're kind of looking at these alignments and you're like, oh, okay, these look like they're going northwest, southeast. Um, and then you get back down to this area, which is where we're working, which is lower in the terrace. And it's like, uh, okay, how do we orient our grids? Um, we didn't want to orient them in the same direction of the actual walls that we were seeing up here, but we were assured that if we did our grids this way, they would totally not align with the <laughs> with the actual architecture. It's really obvious in the aerial imagery, but, um, but we didn't have that. We aerial. had a pretty traumatic experience on site the first time we were there that resulted in us almost leaving the country immediately. <laughs> Um, we were a little shook up, but we relied on the site surveyor who'd been working there for five years to tell us that the architecture, that these grids he's setting up don't align with the architecture. He has a background in geophysics. We needed to get on the ground and get it done in case we had to leave right away again if we had more issues. Um, and so we trusted him, and that's what we did. We paid <laughs> the price, yeah. obviously. So the GPR data that they were really wanting us to work on uh, with, uh, these are the areas, basically you can obviously see that it's, the walls are lining up directly okay, um, with the architecture that's above. Um, the area that they were so interested in over here, we were getting very little data, both with the magnetometry and the geophysics, and actually these things that you see are features from the top, they're just rocks piled up that or piled it and repiled. And so this is what the GPR ended up looking like. And this is what the mag ended up looking like. This is actually a combination of both um, the original mag where we were oriented completely along um, with the architecture. But then Katie went back out the next year and did a completely different survey where she has a baseline going like this, and then she did everything going in a different direction. And the walls that you're seeing that are limestone really like show up quite nicely. Um, and then this is just like really brief and quick interpretations, but the light and dark, <coughs> dark blue are going to be the, the magnetometry, and then the GPR is the red. So without that magnetometry, I don't think you would have really gotten very much information out of that GPR data. Of course, we could always do way more processing and everything. Um, and what's interesting here is, and I didn't see this, but we're having a lot of problems with the, the magnetometry data. But um, this area ended up being uh, kind of more consistent with what they think of as residential houses. So they might want to go to that location and, instead of where they were trying to dig before. And I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions about that, we'd love to talk about it. There's some really interesting alignments between both sensor data sets and then a little bit of um, differences, which have been really interesting to talk about and try to interpret. And we look forward to publishing that. Um, so our conclusions are that, I'm sorry, let me do my notes. Some obvious things, obviously, avoid some of the pitfalls that we all ran into in going to the field. Um, and some things that are specific to our types of projects, don't take, their, don't take our collaborators' words for everything as, as much as we can, question all the information that we're provided with. Um, Take, take multiple sensors whenever we can. Always throw in a kite with a camera and a little thermal camera if you can. Um, but most importantly, um, that what we've learned is educating the people we're working with about geophysics is the best way to avoid a lot of these scenarios. Um, not in the sense that we tell them that they're wrong, but by example, showing them how to do this properly um, 
And I think it's really important to have, as Christine mentioned, this background in North American archaeology where we're working with really subtle features, where we have to have very strict survey methodologies. We don't walk around with a magnetometer like this and get great data. We always have to be as strict as possible. Um, and, and so just, just educating by example, but always taking every opportunity to talk to our collaborators about how information, how our data should be interpreted properly. Um, but like in the case of Dionysio, where we showed up on site and said we never would have done this before, I think one important lesson is to jump, jump into these projects where we think we're not going to get anything out of it. Because it, in, in some of these cases, we actually have gotten some extremely exciting data in situations and environments that were incredibly challenging and uh, we didn't think would be successful at all. But that's one of the reasons that geophysics hasn't been done that much in British Columbia, for example, on, on these islands because of these really restrictive environments that they're working in. And because we were forced into this situation, we ended up coming with some, up with some really good results. And likewise in Bucera, throwing in the magnetometer and doing something that was predicted to be, uh, to result in poor data didn't. So I think we're out of time, but if anyone has a quick question.